Good afternoon. Now, last time we talked about building virus particles, the principles of construction, and we learned that they're metastable, that they have to be stable to protect the genome as it goes from host to host, and then they have to come apart. Today we're going to learn how the particles come apart. We're going to talk about how viruses attach to cells and how they enter and give up their genomes. Who hath deceived thee so often as thyself is a wonderful quote for this lecture. Because as you will see, it is your own cell surface proteins that welcomes viruses into the cells and brings them in. Now remember, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get inside of a cell to replicate, no exception. So need to get inside, they have to cross that plasma membrane. But the problem is they can't diffuse in, they're too big to diffuse across the membrane. In order to get in a cell to undergo their reproductive cycle, they have to be taken up. And as you may know, you should know that cells have active processes for taking up materials from the extracellular milieu, whether they're small molecules, water, uh, uh, gases, all the way up to very large proteins. There are mechanisms by which they get in, and viruses have evolved to take advantage of those processes because the viruses have to get in some way. Now, I want you to picture viruses floating around in you, coursing in your bloodstream, flowing through every tissue. They're randomly bumping into cells, right? Because there are a lot of viruses around, there are lots of cells, they're bumping into each other, but not every cell is going to support the replication of a virus. Uh, so the virus needs to find the right cell, right in quotes, that is the one it will replicate in. Of course, the virus doesn't know anything. All, it, all that has to be done is for the virus to get into a permissive cell where it can replicate. And that starts with binding to a cell receptor. So viruses bump into all sorts of cells, but if there is a receptor on the surface of one type of cell, the virus will bind to it. And not every cell has receptors for all viruses. So there are really two steps to this getting in. First, uh, just bumping into the cell and adhering by electrostatics. And uh, there's no specificity to that. If there's no receptor for the virus on that cell, the virus will fall off and move on to a next cell. But step two, if there is a receptor for that particular virus, uh, the virus will attach to it. And then the final step, the genome will go in the cell. We'll talk about these steps today, virus attachment, to receptors and uh, entry into the cell and releasing the genome. Sometimes there's one receptor for a particular virus, sometimes they need two. We'll talk about examples of both today. But these are very specific interactions. They are a virus binding to a cell membrane protein uh, and it's extremely specific. All of the different viruses out there do not recognize the same receptor by any means. There are many different kinds of receptors for viruses, although some diverse viruses do share receptors. Receptors are essential for the infection of all viruses with the exception of viruses of fungi. Most of those don't have extracellular phases. They reproduce in the cell, in the fungal cell. They divide in the cell, and then when the fungi divide by binary fission, the viruses partition into the two daughter cells. So most fungal viruses don't leave the fungus, so there's no need for a receptor for them to get in. Plant viruses, similarly, do not require a receptor to get into the plant cell. The way plant viruses get into plant cells is typically by mechanical damage. An insect takes a meal, draws sap from a plant and will inject viruses while doing that. Nematodes also feed on plants. They can deliver viruses or just farmers running over plants with their farm equipment that's contaminated, mechanical damage. So no receptors, the plant viruses get right into cells. But for all the viruses, the rest of the viruses that we'll talk about, mainly viruses that infect animals in this course, we need a receptor to get into those cells. And this has been a, a relatively recent field for expanding our understanding. Until 1985, we only knew of one receptor for any virus, and that's for influenza virus, because it turns out it was a sugar that could be easily removed from cells using an enzyme called neuraminidase. So many people would take neuraminidase and treat cells and, sh and see that influenza viruses would no longer infect. But as for all the other viruses out there, we had no idea what their receptors were. However, that's now different. Uh, 
And the reason is we have a number of enabling technologies. I want to first talk about some of the criteria that we use to say this molecule on the cell is a receptor for this particular virus. Uh, you have to fulfill certain criteria, and here they are. If you fulfill all of these, it's perfect. It's a really good story. Some papers will fulfill one or two, others all of them. If you identify a protein on the cell surface that you think is your virus receptor, obviously you have to show that it binds your virus. So either on the cell surface or you can produce the protein by recombinant methods, you show that it will bind the virus particle. So here's an example of uh, the, the uh, receptor for HIV CD4 binding the HIV glycoprotein SU. Another good way to demonstrate virus receptor specificity is to make an antibody against the receptor protein and show that it blocks infection with the virus. And a third way, you somehow get the gene encoding the receptor. We, many ways you could do that. You then put it into cells that do not have the receptor and then hopefully the gene will be expressed, the receptor will be put on the surface and you can then infect those cells. So in this little cartoon here, the smiling cells have no receptor for your virus so they can't be infected. But if you introduce DNA, you could take total genomic DNA from a cell that has the receptor and expresses it and put those into these cells by transformation. A subset of the cells will produce the receptor and they can be infected and that's why they're unhappy here. Now we can disrupt specific genes. So let's say you identify a gene in a cell for poliovirus receptor. You could go one step further, you could actually disrupt it using CRISPR-Cas9 techniques. So you would make a short RNA complementary to your gene of interest, deliver it to cells that also produce the nuclease Cas9, and the, the short RNA will, will hybridize in the presence of, of another protein to your DNA, and then Cas9 will cut it. And then the cell will repair it and mess it up. And so there'll essentially be a disruption of the gene. And this, of course, has recently developed last five years or so. So we can use that to pretty much validate any gene, as long as, of course, it's not essential uh, for growth in cell culture. And the enabling technologies that have totally propelled this field include recombinant DNA, of course, so you can clone receptor genes and put them in cells, uh, monoclonal antibodies, 1976, that was developed, flow cytometry, uh, the, the ability to purify single cells based on what is expressed on their surfaces using specific antibodies, nucleotide sequencing, of course, and siRNA and CRISPR-Cas9 system. Now we have receptors for many, many viruses out there, and as soon as a new virus uh, is identified, within a year, you not only have the cryo-EM structure of the virus particle, but we can identify the receptor as well. And here are some uh, receptors for various viruses. Now, uh, most receptors are plasma membrane proteins. And of course, on the top is a, is a diagram of the plasma membrane. Just to remember you that it's a leaflet made, made up of uh, lipids, of course, and it is full of various kinds of proteins. There are integral membrane proteins that span the membrane. They have extracellular and intracellular domains. Uh, there are lipid anchored proteins, uh, which this one is only on the cytosolic phase, so that couldn't be a receptor for a virus, but it could also be lip lipid an anchored on the top as well. Uh, and there are carbohydrates decorating many of these uh, plasma membrane proteins, and viruses can attach to just the carbohydrate part or sometimes the protein, often the protein as well. At the bottom are a number of examples of virus receptors that are on the cell surface. So at the bottom are shown the names of the cell proteins, and at the top are various viruses that attach to them. And you can see, even if you don't know what the abbreviations are, that sometimes there are multiple different viruses attaching uh, to the cell receptor. So here we have adeno-associated virus, human papillomavirus, herpes simplex, vaccinivirus, all different viruses attaching to heparin sulfate proteoglycan. We have all different proteins. We have monomers. Uh, like the low-density lipoprotein receptor, we have multimers, we have immunoglobulin-like proteins, we have chemokine receptors, integrins, heterodimers in that case. All sorts of proteins can serve as virus receptors. And I just want you to remember that 
these do not exist for the virus, right? They have their own functions. The viruses have evolved to be able to bind to them. So we, it would really be counterproductive for us to have vi uh, receptors just for viruses. And if they were only there for viruses, we would rapidly lose the genes encoding them, right? There would be evolutionary pressure for us to lose a gene that encodes just a virus receptor. But all these receptors have specific functions. For example, one of, one of the virus receptors not shown here is the transferrin receptor. This is a cell receptor that binds transferrin, which in turn binds iron to get it in the cell. It's an essential uh, element. And the binding site for transferrin on the transferrin receptor is distinct from the binding site for viruses. It binds two different kinds of viruses. I learned yesterday it also binds malaria parasites, this transferrin receptor. The reason that is is so that the gene can change in response to the pressure of the virus, but not alter its ability to take up transferrin. So all these proteins have cell functions. You need to remember that. Don't ever think that they exist for the parasite to get in. Now, most of the time, one virus, one receptor, three types of polioviruses, they all bind the same receptor. But sometimes different viruses can bind the same receptor. And here are some examples of that. Uh, adenovirus, which you now will recognize in the familiar Sputnik diagram, and Coxsackie virus B3, both bind the same receptor. In fact, we'll, we'll encounter this later on. Uh, Coxsackie virus is named after this town in upstate New York, Coxsackie, New York. Exit 21B on the um, New York State Thruway. I took the picture one day when I was driving by with my mm -hmm. camera. Been waiting for years to drive by so I could show people pictures of Coxsackie, New York. There you go. To swine herpes virus, which is called pseudorabies virus. It's a weird name, but it infects pigs. It binds the same receptor as poliovirus, two different viruses binding the same receptor. So this happens all the time. The viruses have evolved to simply bind the same receptor molecule. Uh, and then sometimes viruses within the same family may bind different receptors. So for example, there are three different cell receptors for rhinoviruses. There are 16, probably more, receptors for retroviruses. And sometimes one virus binds multiple receptors. So here's herpes simplex virus type 1. It has four glycoproteins in its envelope. And these engage a number of cell molecules, as you can see here. I would never ask you to memorize any of these interactions. What I want you to remember is that receptors are cell proteins that have a function. Sometimes one virus binds a single receptor. Sometimes two virus will bind the same receptor. And sometimes there are multiple receptors for one virus. That's the part that I want you to remember. Now let's talk about how viruses attach to these receptors first, because there are two, the two general topologies of virus particles I want to talk about, icosahedral particles and enveloped par particles, because there are two different problems here. Start with icosahedral particles. Uh, on the left is the structure of poliovirus bound to its cellular receptor. What was done here, it's actually done many years ago in my lab, we made a soluble version of the poliovirus receptor. We had cloned the gene. We cut off the transmembrane domain, and we expressed it in a cell. We purified it and mixed it with the virus particle. And then our collaborators solved the cryo-EM structure of the complex. So the virus is in colors, blue, yellow, and red. And the receptor is in gray. And the receptor is an immunoglobulin-like protein. Its structure is expanded on the right here. Immunoglobulin-like simply means that the fold of the protein is similar to that of immunoglobulins. And the receptor binds around the five-fold axis of symmetry. So there is one five-fold axis. You can recognize the pentamer shape. You can see one, two, three, four, five receptor molecules binding in there. And there is around each five-fold axis, there are 12 of them. So you could, in principle, bind 60 receptor molecules, which is what we think is happening here. Around the five-fold axis, there's a depression in the particle. And you can see that in this cartoon here. Here we have a single receptor molecule. It's called CD155. Here's the virus particle. There's the five-fold axis of symmetry in blue. The blue 
uh, pentagon. And you can see the first domain of the receptor fitting into this groove, which encircles the fivefold axis of symmetry. Now, when the structure of polio was first determined, way back in 1985, that was the first animal virus structure determined. People saw this groove and they said, wow, this must be where the receptor binds. And that must be where it is for all viruses that have an icosahedral shape. It's a typical thing. You get all excited and you say it must be this way all the time. But it's never that way all the time. It turns out that some viruses do have a little groove in their surface and the receptor fits in there like poliovirus. But here on the right is rhinovirus, a very similar virus, same family. And rhinovirus has a groove around the five-fold axis. Uh, you can sort of see it at the very top there. But the receptor doesn't bind there. The receptor for that virus is low-density lipoprotein receptor, LDLR. And it's shown here in gray. And you can see it's not fitting into the groove. It's sitting on the plateau at that five-fold axis. Each five-fold axis is a little flat on top. And that's where this receptor fits. The moral of the story is don't think lock and key all the time. Just because there's a lock doesn't mean a key goes into it. Sometimes the receptor just binds on a flat surface. And so since then, we've solved structures of many, many different uh, viruses. And there are many ways that receptors can interact in grooves, on flat surfaces, in loops on the surface, and so forth. Now, here's another example, adenovirus. And I show this to you because it's, it's really different. It's an icosahedral virus, and it could have evolved to have a groove or a flat surface for receptor binding, but it didn't. Adenovirus, of course, has these wonderful fibers at each five-fold axis of symmetry. And I told you yesterday that each fiber is tipped with a, a globular protein that's shown here in this diagram. Uh, and in fact, the um, structure of that globular domain uh, has been solved. And it, it, that globular domain, you can see it's a trimer, is what actually binds the cell receptor. And the, the molecule at the top here is actually the fiber trimer shown in blue and red binding to the receptor, which is the lighter color uh, behind it. So the fiber, the knob or the end of the fiber binds the receptor very specifically. On the very left is the structure of this entire assembly. We have the penton base, which is the uh, pentamer at each five-fold axis of the particle. We have the shaft, uh, which is made up of three copies of the fiber protein. You can see they twist around each other in a helical manner. So here we have elements of helical symmetry. The capsid is icosahedral. The fibers are helical. And at the end are the knobs. And again, the knobs interact uh, with the cellular receptor. Again, you can have lots of different ways of interaction of icosahedral capsids with receptors. So let's turn to some enveloped viruses. Here it's a different problem because, as you know, an enveloped virus needs to have integral membrane glycoproteins embedded in the envelope. I told you that last time. And now you'll see why that has to be so that the virus particles can attach to cellular receptors. So here's a diagram of influenza virus interacting uh, with its cellular receptor. Influenza virus is an enveloped particle. It has a couple of different kinds of proteins in its membrane. And the main, the main two are uh, hemagglutinin on the HA and neuraminidase, or NA. And the hemagglutinin is the protein that attaches to the cell receptor. You're going to hear hemagglutinin quite a bit in this course, uh, not only in terms of entry today, but later on in terms of disease. So here we have hemagglutinin binding to the cell receptor. The cell surface is shown by this tan uh, line. Uh, the receptor is the orange box, and the hemagglutinin is uh, binding to it. So the hemagglutinin on the influenza virus particle binds the cell receptor. So for all enveloped viruses, there's always a glycoprotein whose function is to interact with the cell receptor. It has other functions as well, but that's a main one. Now, what is the cell receptor for uh, influenza virus? It's a sugar. It's a sugar called sialic acid. First, let's look at this uh, sugar in context. This sugar, it's a single sialic acid shown in yellow, is always the last sugar on the sugar chain of a glycoprotein. So here on the top left is a glycoprotein, transmembrane protein, and here are two carbohydrate chains covalently attached to it. And these spheres are different kinds of sugars, 
if sialic acid is present, sialic acid is always the last sugar. And that is the receptor for influenza viruses. Doesn't matter what the protein is, all that matters is the sugar. As you will see in a moment, the HA attaches specifically to that sugar. So here is sialic acid uh, on the right in panel B. You can see it has a six carbon ring, typical of sugars, and then some side chains. Um, and then it's connected to the next sugar in this sugar chain. Here it happens to be galactose, but it can be a number of different sugars. Uh, and what's important here is actually for influenza viruses, the bond connecting sialic acid uh, to the um, second sugar there. So you can see in the top, it's connected via what we call an alpha 2, 3 linkage. There's an oxygen in between. There's a carbon on each end, of course, in the six carbon ring. And so that's an alpha 2, 3 uh, connection. Uh, influenza viruses that infect birds bind to alpha-2,3 linked sialic acids. And we don't have a lot of alpha-2,3 linked sialic acids in our upper respiratory tract. They're mainly pretty low down in our tract, so we typically don't get infected with avian influenza viruses. We humans have lots of alpha-2,6 sialic acids in our respiratory tract, and those are, those are shown at the bottom of the structure here. Here is the uh, alpha-2 carbon, and there is the six carbon. It's, it's not in the ring, but it's uh, off the ring, the CH2. So that's an alpha-2-6 linkage. And the linkage alone is enough to allow one influenza virus and not another to attach to it. Again, alpha-2-3 avian strains, alpha-2-6 human strains. We'll talk more about this later because when we talk about pathogenesis, it makes a difference uh, in terms of what viruses will infect you. So that is the receptor for influenza viruses. Now, many years ago, the structure of the HA bound to sialic acid was solved by X-ray crystallography, and that is shown on the left. So that is the HA molecule. Uh, it is present on the virus surface as a trimer, but we're showing just a monomer here. You can see it is embedded in the virus membrane. It consists of a fibrous stem and a globular head. Whenever you see diagrams of this protein, the HA, you'll see it drawn sort of like a lollipop, if you will. And the sialic acid binds in the globular head in a groove at the very top. And now on the right here, this expansion, we're now looking down on the HA molecule from the top, and we're looking at sialic acid in green, which is bound to this little pocket in the HA molecule. So this is sialic acid, it's quite a small it's a six carbon sugar with some side chains. It's pretty small. So there's a very small groove at the very top of the HA. Fits right in there, and that's how the HA binds to the sialic acid. The sialic acid makes a number of interactions with side chains, and those are important for binding. If you change those, the sialic acid will not bind. The virus can't uh, infect cells. So those are highly conserved, uh, those interactions. So that is the way HA binds to uh, sialic acid. We know a lot about this interaction. Just another example, this is HIV attaching to its cellular receptor. So HIV is also a, a an envelope virus with glycoproteins in its envelope as diagrammed on the left here. In contrast to influenza virus, HIV binds to a protein. It actually binds to two different proteins, but we're looking at the interaction with the first protein receptor here, and that protein is called CD4. It's shown in brown here. In both diagrams, we have a little ribbon diagram in the middle, and on the right is a space-filling diagram, or a cartoon, actually. CD4 is an immunoglobulin-like protein, just like uh, the, the polio receptor and many other virus receptors, and it interacts with the viral glycoprotein in this manner. In both of these a and B panels, the viral glycoprotein is shown in red. It's called SU. It's present on the surface of the particle. And you can see it kind of wraps around the last domain of CD4 and interacts with it. And in particular, there's a cavity in SU protein where a phenylalanine of CD4, number 43, phenylalanine 43, uh, sticks in, and this is a really important interaction between CD4 and HIV. If you change phenylalanine 43 on CD4 to anything else, it will knock out binding of HIV. 
So it's a crucial residue. Again, the virus has evolved to attach to this protein in this manner. Again, via the glycoprotein. The membrane alone is not able to do this. First question, viral receptors on the cell surface. A, can bind directly to icosahedral virus capsid proteins. B, interact with glycoproteins of envelope viruses. C, can be carbohydrate or protein molecules. D, have cellular functions. E, all of the above. 95% of you, all of the above, which is right. They're all right. Uh, they can bind to capsid proteins. They can bind to glycoproteins. They can be carbohydrates or protein molecules. They have cellular function. Let's talk about how viruses get into cells now. Now, cells have mechanisms for taking up material from the extracellular milieu, as I told you. There are kind of two broad general mechanisms. One on the left, phagocytosis takes up big particles into the cell, one to two microns. Um, this is carried out by a variety of cells, in particular cells of the immune system that are taking up fragments of, uh, that may or may not be foreign to try and sample them or destroy them. And in general, this is not how viruses get into cells as far as we know. On the right are two ways that we think viruses get into cells. One, and they both fall under the category of endocytosis. One is called macropinocytosis on the left, where smaller molecules up to virus size can be just simply taken up almost non-specifically, but there are some receptor interactions involved. Uh, when bits of the membrane come out in a process called ruffling, they make little pockets and they capture extracellular molecules and bring them into the cell. So it very, can be non-specific. So water and other solutes can be taken up this way. You can imagine it's just grabbing bits of the surrounding medium and bringing them in. So some viruses get in that way. But most viruses are brought in by receptor-mediated endocytosis, a very specific process that uh, is designed to bring specific things into the cell. For example, you want to bring some iron into the cell. We have iron-binding proteins called transferrins. And then those in turn bind to transferrin receptors on the cell surface, and then they are taken up by receptor-mediated endocytosis. So here we have a ligand, could be transferrin binding to a transferrin receptor, taken up by endocytosis and eventually is released into the cytosol. So this is a cellular process that has been uh, usurped by viruses to get into cells, as we will see, and it's, it's receptor-mediated. Now, uh, one caveat that I have to give you ahead of time. When we draw pictures of cells, the cytoplasm is most always pretty empty, but that's not the way it is. The cytoplasm is really crowded. And this is a beautiful diagram uh, by David Goodsell of the crowded cytoplasm. It starts on the left. Here's the plasma membrane at the top, those green, they look like trees, but they're actually plasma membrane proteins. And then we have some actin filaments below. The plasma membrane is in yellow. Then we move down. You can see some microtubules. You can see some ribosomes. You keep moving in. You got some, uh, uh, some Golgi and some endoplasmic reticulum, some clathrin cages there. You keep moving in. And then on the third panel here, we get to the uh, nuclear membrane. So that big blue thing is a nuclear uh, pore and things, some things are coming through it. The yellow is the nuclear membrane. And finally, we're in the nucleus. You can see it's full of histones and other things as well. Really crowded. The bottom line is that viruses do not diffuse through the cytoplasm. There's no way. It would take them weeks from, to get from the cell surface to the nucleus. Well, maybe weeks is an exaggeration, but it would take too long, and it would, replication would never occur. So there have to be specific processes uh, that bring viruses through the cytoplasm. And then, of course, are the uh, microtubules that have motor proteins running along them that bring the endosome vesicles into the cell, bring things out away from the nucleus. Viruses hitch onto those as well. And I think we have uh, a diagram of that here. So here's a cell being infected with many viruses. It's meant to summarize uh, what, what are the different processes that can go on. And you can see here on the left, uh, there's an envelope virus which is fusing its membrane right at the plasma membrane uh, of the cell and the viral genome is being released. And that can get replication going right away, as you might imagine. Here's another envelope virus uh, fusing with the plasma membrane. And it's capsid now binds to 
a motor protein, dynein, and it's carried down the microtubules by dynein motors uh, down to the centrosome, and eventually we'll get to the nucleus. This happens to be a DNA virus that has to dock onto the nuclear pore complex. So motors involved. Um, other viruses that end up in the cytoplasm, here's an RNA virus, but again, it is taken up by endocytosis. It's, the endosome actually moves along the microtubule by dynein mechanisms, and at some point the genome leaves. All, in all cases, movement through the cytoplasm, whether it's naked virus particles or vesicles like endosomes containing virus particles, uh, that always happens by motor driven transport, it requires ATP. And the reason is because the cytoplasm uh, is too crowded to be able to have viruses simply diffusing and get where they need to be. We're going to look at some of these mechanisms now. Uh, first we have a movie, an animation of endosome movement on a microtubule. There's your endosome in blue, the dynein motor is attached to both the endosome and the microtubule filament and it is walking happily along there, coming from the plasma membrane to the nucleus. I think this works because it looks like a person pulling a load into the cell, right? So you can imagine someone who doesn't have a lot of science background really getting it. So if there's a virus in there, the virus is being brought into the cell. Uh, and if it's just an uninfected cell, there, there are cell proteins coming from the plasma membrane. I really like that that particular animation. You saw that some viruses fuse their membranes at the cell surface, at the plasma membrane, and others fuse inside the cell. We're going to talk about this process of fusion in a bit of detail now because it's really important. Fusion always has to be regulated. Why? Because viruses can't be bumping into any membrane and fusing with it because maybe it's not the right cell. Okay, so fusion has to be exquisitely regulated, so only with specificity does it fuse with the cell that will be the one that it can replicate in. So how do we ensure that the right cell is encountered so that fusion happens in the right place? And by the way, this, this starts the whole, our whole journey into understanding metastability, the unstable part. How do viruses give up their genomes? This is part of that as well. So we have here uh, one example of an envelope virus which is binding to a receptor on the plasma membrane and in this case it fuses right at the plasma membrane. It fuses at neutral pH and then the genome gets into the cell and in this case it's a nucleocapsid RNA protein complex it can replicate right there. If it's a DNA virus it might have to go to the nucleus. How do we get specificity so that the fusion occurs in the right place? There are two examples of how that occurs here. On the top, we have a, a blow up of the virus receptor interaction. So the virus is shown here, viral membrane. We have a, a protein called HN, which is kind of like the HA of flu, but a little different. And that's going to bind the cellular receptor. Right next to it is an F protein. F stands for fusion. This is the protein that's going to catalyze the fusion of the virus membrane with that of the cell. So what happens is this, um, this HN protein recognizes its receptor on the cell surface. The receptor's in red. Okay, so now the virus is attached. And then, and only then, does the fusion protein work. When the HN attaches to the receptor, that's a signal for the fusion protein to swing around and fuse the membranes together. So what do I mean by that? This fusion protein has at its very end terminus a hydrophobic sequence. We call that a fusion peptide. And it's normally hidden against the viral membrane. It's protected so that it doesn't fuse with just any cell. Not only that, but this um, fusion peptide is actually internal in the protein sequence. And only when the end terminus of the fusion peptide is cleaved, which only happens in the right cell, can that fusion peptide be exposed. So you can see in panel B, the fusion peptide is exposed. It's still buried up against the viral membrane, so it doesn't fuse with just anything. And only when the right signal is present, that is receptor engagement, does the fusion peptide flip around, inserts into the membrane, and catalyzes fusion. So that's one mechanism to ensure that fusion happens in the right place. The one on the bottom is, is used by HIV. And that's quite interesting because uh, it involves two receptors. So sometimes fusion 
is regulated by just one receptor interaction, sometimes two. Here we have HIV with its SU protein. I showed you SU before as binding to CD4, and it's right next to a, a, a transmembrane protein. That happens to be the name in HIV for the protein that contains the fusion peptide. SU engages the receptor, which is called CD4, but then there's a second receptor engagement necessary to a chemokine receptor. CCR stands for chemokine. Uh, the chemokine will then engage SU, will only engage SU if it's first engaged CD4, and when those two engagements occur, CD4 and chemokine receptor, then the fusion peptide swings out and the two membranes can fuse. So these are just two examples of the way you make sure that fusion occurs uh, in the right place by uh, you know, having receptor specificity. It can be one receptor uh, or two different receptors. All right, so now I think we have a um, movie of this. This is a movie of HIV fusion. Uh, there's HIV in red. These are lymphocytes in purple, some red blood cells. We're obviously in the bloodstream. And this virus is approaching the lymphocyte. Here we have CD4 and the chemokine receptors on the cell surface. And HIV is going to approach. It's a little dramatic, this, this particular video. And there's HIV. See, not a lot of glycoproteins on its surface. It's pretty sparse compared to, say, flu. There's uh, SU is the globular part. Fusion peptide was in the blue. So SU is going to bind first CD4, which are these elongated receptors. There you go. You've got to swing back and forth a little. I don't, you know, the artist did that. And then it's going to engage the chemokine receptor. And at that point, then the fusion peptide can swing out. Now, at this point, they decided to throw away the, the glycoproteins. <laughs> because uh, they didn't know what to do with them, but they, they still remain there. And you see the fusion peptide swings out. It's, and now it's in the uh, host cell membrane, and it's going to fuse. Now, you may be thinking, well, how does fusion happen? To fuse two membranes, you have to bring them really close together. You've got to get rid of all the water in between. So this is not close enough. The fusion peptide's in the cell membrane, but the next step is that these fusion pe peptides undergo what's called hair pinning. They fold. And you're going to see in a moment how this happens with this particular configuration. And that brings the two membranes right next to each other, and then they will fuse. So it turns out that's all you need to do. Bring membranes right against each other, and they will fuse. And hairpinning is the way uh, that this happens. So let me show you uh, how that goes. We have another movie illustrating that. So this is uh, the viral fusion protein. The viral fusion protein, there's the viral membrane. There's the cell membrane, right? So. The fusion peptide is already inserted into the cell membrane. And what is going to happen is this thing is going to start forming a double alpha helix, and that's going to cause the protein to hairpin, and the two membranes will be pulled together. You see that? Now they left the membrane down there. But you can imagine if this part is still attached to the viral membrane, it's going to bring the viral membrane uh, and the cell membrane together. Now all this works as a trimer. Again, virus on the bottom, cell on the top. And they're going to animate it now for us. You can see the second alpha helix is forming. That's what we mean by hairpinning. The two membranes are coming together. It has to bend to allow the two membranes to get totally close. And then eventually, boom, the two membranes fuse. Right now, we have only one of the leaflets fused. This is called a hemifusion intermediate. And so the pore basically expands, and uh, the second leaflet fuses. And now we have a pore going from the virus uh, into the cell. So that's how all of that works. So that's called hairpinning. So not only do you have to get the fusion peptide uh, against the cell membrane, then you have to pull the two together again. Uh, virus entry, for some reason, there are lots of animations. I guess it's that kind of process that lends it to animating. Our next question. Which of the following does not play a role in virus entry? Clathrin-mediated endocytosis, fusion of viral and plasma membranes, diffusion of virus particles in the cytoplasm, microtubule-mediated transport. Most of you got diffusion of virus particles, which is obviously correct. It does not play a role, diffusion. But a lot of you got lysosomes, because I didn't mention them. So lysosomes, 
sometimes play a role in cell entry. Most of the time, when an endosome is coming in the cell, the end game is fusion with a lysosome, which has digestive enzymes in it, right? And if there are cargo in the endosome, the, the cell can take it apart and use it. That's what the lysosome fusion is for. But viruses, for the most part, want to get out before then. So those of you who said it doesn't play a role, that's mostly true. But there are some viruses that actually go to the lysosome, and we're going to see them today. This whole process of the fusion peptide being flipped, we talked about how it happens on the cell surface for some viruses, right? With receptor engagement, the fusion peptide flips out. All that, hap that fusion happens at neutral pH because the plasma membrane is at pH 7. But for many viruses, they're brought into endosomes, and the fusion happens within the endosome as the pH drops. So it's low pH catalyzed. And here's an example of that. Influenza virus is an example of a virus that works that way. All right, so here, top left, we have influenza virus binding sialic acid receptors. Now it gets taken up into the cell by the endocytic pathway. It's ending up in an endosome. And the bottom is a diagram of the configuration of the HA molecule. Three uh, monomers, three globular heads. The globular heads are attached to the cell receptor. As the endosome moves in the cell, protons are pumped in. There's a pump in the endosome membrane that pumps protons in. That acidifies the endosome interior. So you see protons going in. As the pH drops as it gets to about five and a half. That triggers a conformational change in the HA protein. What do you think happens? Well, let's look at this HA protein. We'll start on the left at the neutral pH. Uh, you can see there are three alpha helices, and then there's a yellow protein, and then there's another alpha helix at the bottom. Well, it turns out at the bottom of those alpha helices, that's where the fusion peptide is. It's hidden. Makes sense, because you don't want these viruses fusing with just anything. As the pH of the endosome drops, watch what happens. Step two, it's the fusion peptides are still down there. Step three, pop, up they go to the cell membrane. Okay, so the three fusion peptides have the red on the ends. They are buried down here. Normally at, at neutral pH, at acidic pH, they pop up. They insert into the cell membrane. So the three fusion peptides are in red. They're now inserted into the cell membrane. And as you might guess, then the protein begins to hairpin, just like the HIV glycoprotein does. It brings the two membranes together, and you have a pore form uh, so that the genome of the virus can come out. So this is pH-dependent fusion. Well, how is it made specific? By the virus only binding to cells that have uh, the appropriate receptor. And then it is catalyzed by pH drop uh, in the endosome. So here's a diagram of the HA protein a monomer, just so you can see what's happening. On the left is the neutral pH structure, globular head, sialic acid binding part, an extended alpha helix that makes up the fibrous stem. Here is the viral membrane at the bottom. Where's the fusion peptide? It's in this yellow part down here near the viral membrane. And just like those viruses that fuse at the cell surface, the fusion peptide is not exposed unless th uh, this protein has been cleaved by the right proteases in the right cell. Cleavage of that loop exposes the fusion peptide. You can see two N-termini are generated. One of them contains the fusion peptide. And then when the pH drops, that fusion peptide reorients and is put at the top of the molecule. And these last two structures are aligned um, so that the alpha helices are, are aligned. So you can see there's some extra alpha helix that forms that low pH, and that's what drives the fusion peptide to the top of the molecule, where it can then insert into the cell. So it's low pH mediated fusion, and cleavage is absolutely necessary for fusion, because if you don't have a cleaved HA, the um, fusion peptide is not exposed. Same thing as we saw on the cell surface. This kind of fusion, this kind of acid-mediated fusion, reorientation of the fusion peptide, is typical of what we call class I fusion proteins. And they're typical of many different viruses, influenza virus, um, a paramyxovirus, Ebola virus, HIV, a mouse retrovirus. You can see uh, that they all form these, these trimers with extended uh, alpha helical conformations on the top of which is the fusion peptide. 
So these, all of these are perpendicular to the membrane. They form spikes. They're mostly alpha helical and they form trimers. So that's a class one fusion protein. And here's a, an animation of influ. All right, so that's class one fusion proteins. Remember the other day I showed you some viruses where the fusion proteins are actually laying down parallel to the membrane of the virus. And I want to just show you how that works because you may be wondering, well, how, you know, I could see the HA, it's already perpendicular and I could see the, the fusion peptide working, but if a protein is lying on a membrane, how does that work for fusion? So this is what we call class two fusion proteins. They're mo mostly made of beta sheets. You can see very little alpha helical structure. They make dimers and they're parallel to the membrane. There's a Flavivirus virus on the upper right. You can see uh, the dimers laying parallel to the membrane. They work in very much the same way. These viruses bind receptors. They're taken up into the cell by endocytosis. As the pH drops, these proteins, which are normally lying parallel to the membrane, they simply reorient. They rise up. And here you see them uh, going up into the Here's the viral membrane at the bottom. At low pH, they stick up. The fusion peptide is at the tip. So that sends the fusion peptide into the cell membrane. They then hairpin, pull the membranes together, and a pore forms. Now, cleavage is also involved. With the HAU member and with the other surface fusing viruses, it was the cleavage of the actual F protein that was required for fusion. It turns out here a second protein actually hides the fusion protein and it has to be cleaved away. But the principle is the same. You regulate fusion uh, by cleavage of a, of a protein. And we have an animation of dengue virus entry, a flavivirus. There it is, binding receptors, taken up by endocytosis, moving along microtubules. The endosome, of course, is acidifying at this point. And when the acidification occurs, then the um, glycoproteins all reach up, start waving their hands, their arms. You can see now they're all vertical, they're all perpendicular. And at the end is the fusion peptide, which is going to stick into this, the endosome membrane, which is at the top there. And then the hair printing starts. They bring the two uh, membranes together. There you go, and that's going to form a fusion pore. I don't, this insectoid motion, I don't get, you know, I don't know why they added that, but you get the point. Here comes out the dengue virus uh, genome uh, out of the endosome, and now it's a plus stranded genome, so it could be directly translated uh, as it reaches the cytoplasm. So that's type 2 fusion proteins. One last uh, fusion example, because it's different and establishes a new principle, and that is the entry of Ebola virus, which is a filovirus. Philo meaning thread, because when they were first seen, they had this long, elongated appearance, and of course, Ebola virus causing, a, causing a periodic devastating uh, outbreaks, mainly in Africa. These viruses appear to engage some sort of protein on the cell surface, but no one's ever identified it. it could, just as well be that it's taken up by pinocytosis. So that little green molecule there, we're not sure what that is. Let's not worry about that for now, but let's just go into an endosome. So here's the virus particle. It's enveloped. It's got glycoproteins on its surfaces, attaches to cells, is taken up probably by pinocytosis, and we end up uh, in an endosome. How does fusion occur? Well, it's not just low pH that triggers fusion. That's part of the process. But it turns out there is a protein in the endosome called NPC1. This is a cholesterol transporter. It's named NPC. It stands for Neiman Pick cholesterol transporter because there is a cholesterol transport and storage disease called Neiman Pick disease, which is a fatal disease. You have it. You don't make the right protein. You typically are, it's fatal by the age of 10 or 11 or 12. Um, it turns out that this is the fusion receptor for Ebola virus. So Ebola virus will bind to NPC1 in the endosome, and that catalyzes fusion of the viral and cell membranes, and then the viral genome can get out of the particle uh, into the cytoplasm. 
And one of the experiments that was done to prove that this was the receptor for Ebola virus, they took fibroblasts from patients that had Neiman Pick disease. And these cannot be infected with Ebola virus because they lack um, this protein. So this is unusual because now we have another way that we can regulate fusion by requiring that the virus bind to a fusion, a specific fusion receptor in the endosome. And so this, was, this is kind of a new principle for virus entry. Let me summarize all of that. The main thing you have to remember is that fusion between virus and cell is regulated. It has to be regulated to avoid non-productive fusion interactions, right? You don't want to, if, if fusion were really able to happen easily, the virus would bump into any cell in, a, in the bloodstream or in a tissue and fuse with it, but it would be non-productive. Fusion is regulated so the virus will only get into cells that have the right receptor. And then there are other constraints as well. So uh, for neutral pH fusion, which happens at the plasma membrane, uh, usually a second protein interaction can regulate fusion. Uh, we saw that example with, with HIV. Or we can have at low pH fusion, we can have proteolytic cleavage activating the, the fusion protein for the HA-like proteins, the class one protein. Uh, and if cleavage is not happening, fusion will never happen. And sometimes for the class two proteins, cleavage of a second protein activates the fusion protein. And finally, there's an endosomal fusion receptor for some viruses. So multiple ways of regulating fusion so that it happens uh, in the right place. Uh, viral fusion peptides are exposed for insertion into the host cell membrane when virus particle is near a cell, the virus particle is in the cytoplasm, trimers of the fusion peptides form, the endosome becomes acidified, the virus is docked on the nuclear pore. Most of you got D, which is correct, the endosome becomes acidified. That, of all of these, that's what exposes the fusion peptide. Having a trimer, a lot of you took trimer, is correct. Having a trimer is not enough because even in the trimer form, the fusion peptide is buried and it needs to be exposed by low pH. And uh, being near a cell is not enough either, right? Because that's actually not enough. You, you have to have some assurance that it's the right cell and that involves a receptor uh, interaction. Now, there are two really interesting examples of uncoding of icosahedral particles, three actually, that I want to tell you. So, so far we've talked about envelope virus fusing with cell membranes, either plasma membrane or endosome. What about an icosahedral particle like adenovirus or poliovirus or rheovirus? How would, they, how would you take a pure protein shell and uncode it, make it unstable? So let's look at adenovirus. The virus binds receptor, remember, it's binding via the fiber, the little globular knob at the end of the fiber. It's taken up into cells by endocytosis. Within a very short time, the fibers come off the surface of the particle. The pH drops, and as the pH drops, as you can see by the proton here going into the cell, uh, the virus particle starts to come apart. So it's coming apart is catalyzed in part by a low pH. And in particular, what happens is from the capsid, you remember I told you the other day that in addition to the hexamers and pentamers, there are other proteins that are part of the capsid, not part of the symmetrical property, but have other functions. So one of them is this little uh, yellow triangle there. At low pH, those are released from the capsid and they poke holes in the endosome membrane. So normally they're hidden in the native capsid until it encounters low pH in an endosome. They come out of the capsid and they poke holes in the membrane. They're protein six, you can see them stuck in the endosome membrane. If you just take that protein and make it by itself and add it to membranes, it will lyse them. So the reason the virus doesn't usually poke holes in membranes is because it needs low pH to release those proteins. All right, so now this partially disassembled particle is out of the endosome. It's got to get to the nucleus. This is a DNA virus. It needs to go to the nucleus. Most of the DNA viruses we're going to talk about, with, with one exception, they have to get into the nucleus because that's where DNA gets transcribed, where mRNA is made. And so this virus is no exception. It is brought closer to the nucleus by traveling on microtubules. 
and then it binds to the nuclear pore complex. This is a partially disassembled particle at this point, and once it hits the nuclear pore, it actually comes apart even more, and the DNA can get out of the particle and go right through the nuclear pore. Now, nuclear pores are not big enough to let virus particles through. So there has to be some disassembly, and that's why adeno comes apart. The DNA can get through, that's no problem. But um, the particle has to disassemble so that upon docking to the nuclear pore complex, in a very specific interaction, uh, the DNA can then get in the nucleus. Okay, so that's how this icosahedral virus gets uncoded. Uh, here on the top is an e electron micrograph of adenovirus traveling on a microtubule, and another EM of adenovirus is docked onto nuclear pores. So cytoplasm at the bottom, nucleus at the top, and those are nuclear pores. So good support for this mechanism. All right, that's one mechanism of uncoding or destabilizing an icosahedral particle. Here's a second one, poliovirus. So again, a nice icosahedral shell protects that genome. It's incredibly stable. It passes through your intestinal tract. But at some point, it's got to come apart. So how does it come apart? Well, for polio, the trigger is the receptor. For, adeno for adenovirus, it was low pH. For poliovirus, it doesn't matter what the pH is. If you add poliovirus receptor to poliovirus, it will uncoat the RNA. It will take the RNA out of the particle. So here in the top, we have poliovirus binding to its receptor. Uh, the binding catalyzes a conformational change such that when the particle is taken up by endocytosis, a pore is formed between the particle and the endosome membrane, and the RNA comes out. That pore is formed by the receptor itself. As I said, you can take pure virus and pure receptor. You mix them together, out comes the RNA. We're not quite sure how that happens. The idea is diagrammed on the bottom. We have close-up views of virus and membranes. Here on the left, panel one, the virus is binding two receptor molecules. And the next step, the binding of the receptor catalyzes a conformational change in the particle. We have two viral proteins. These two blue proteins are starting to form a channel in the cell membrane. These two blue proteins are hydrophobic. They're N-termini or hydrophobic, sort of like fusion proteins. And they're normally hidden on the interior of the particle. You can see in panel one, the blue sequence, which is capsid protein VP1, is on the interior. But binding of the receptor causes that to come out of the particle, insert into the membrane, and then that makes a channel through which uh, the viral RNA can flow out into the cytoplasm. So receptor catalyzed conformational alteration leads to the formation of a pore uh, that allows the RNA to come out. Now, if you notice on panel one, there's some curly Q molecule in the, in the virus particle, right? And it's not there on the other panels. And that is a, that's a lipid that's present in all of these viruses. It's a cell-derived lipid. And when the receptor binds to the virus, it pushes that lipid out. And we think that the space where the lipid was gives the virus conformational flexibility so it can move things around and make uh, that opening. Here's a view of that lipid in the virus particle. So there on the upper left is a uh, diagram of the virus particle, five-fold axis. There's a receptor fitting in to that groove around the five-fold axis. And just below the groove is this little channel in which uh, is normally a lipid. The lipid is shown on the lower left here, cellular lipid in white. So there, this would be the groove or the receptor is fitting in. We know this in part because there are antiviral drugs that have been developed which inhibit polio and other virus infectivity. And the way they work is they displace the lipid out of this pocket and they sit in very tightly. So on the upper right is actually a structure of one of these compounds bound in this pocket below the receptor binding site. And that drug does not get out when the receptor binds the virus particle. It's stuck in there by high affinity interactions. And so it locks the particle so it can't uncoat, and that's why it's an antiviral compound. And that uh, compound, unfortunately, has never been licensed because there's too much resistance that develops very quickly. But it's been used in the lab to figure out uh, how uncoating works. Here on the right is a structure of the virus particle with drug, saturating amounts of drug added to it. How many drug copies do you think are present in that virus particle? 60. 60 copies, right. 
So there's 60 subunits, one molecule per subunit. And there would be 60 receptors bound too. All right, the final example is real virus. I showed you last time that this is a cool virus with a double icosahedral shell, an outer shell and an inner shell. And I'm going to tell you why it has that. And I'm going to show you how a lysosome participates in virus entry. Up to now, most viruses want to escape the endocytic pathway so they're not digested at the end. So this virus, two shells, outer and inner, it binds receptors. It's taken up by endocytosis, moves uh, through the endosome, and then the endosome fuses with the lysosome, which contains proteases and nucleases of all sorts. But this virus doesn't mind. Uh, here in the lysosome, the outer capsid is digested away. So if you notice, the virus that binds is different from the virus that comes in because that outer capsid is beginning to be digested away. And eventually, it becomes what's called a core particle, where the outer layer is completely stripped away, and we're only left with these green and orange proteins, which you can see here on the core as green and, and yellow. So that is made in the, in the lysosome. And that turns out to be hydrophobic. So it can fuse its way right out of the lysosome. So that's not a particle you would want to make and have floating around in the extracellular space. It would be sticking to everything, right? But we shield this hydrophobic particle with a second icosahedral sh shell, and that's the virus that goes from cell to cell. And only when that outer shell is stripped off uh, in the endosome, fused with the lysosome, does uh, this come out into the cytoplasm. Now, sometimes you need two receptors for infection. I want to give you an example of that. Uh, Coxsackie requires two receptors, DAF and CAR. Uh, this virus infects at epithelial surfaces. CAR, the, the second receptor, is a component of tight junctions. And viruses that bind apical surfaces of cells can't get into tight junctions because they're tight. Uh, so this is uh, a virus that needs two receptors, DAF and CAR. And by the way, uh, Coxsackie adenovirus receptor, that's the one shared by adenovirus as well. Here's adenovirus uh, binding to a CAR receptor as well. But we're going to talk about Coxsackie virus. Why does it need two receptors? Well, the reason is pretty interesting. The virus binds to the apical layer of epithelial cells. It binds to uh, DAF. But that binding does not lead to virus entry. That's not where the virus enters cells. The virus, in order to enter, has to bind CAR, which is in the tight junction. And it's normally not accessible to the virus. But here's what happens, and this is amazing. When the virus binds DAF, DAF is a signaling protein. Engagement of the virus causes signaling through DAF, which loosens up the actin filament network underneath the membrane. It loosens up the tight junctions, and the virus can surf over and move into the cell, bind CAR, and get endocytosed. So binding to that first receptor is needed to loosen up the junction so the virus can get in and infect uh, on, the, on the tight junction, which is no longer tight, of course. And all of that is done by binding to DAF and all these signaling events happening. So that is one reason why you would need two receptors. So here's a summary of what I've told you. Uh, viruses can fuse at the plasma membrane. They can be transported to the nucleus on microtubules. Endosomes can bring in virus particles on microtubules. Sometimes uncoating occurs. Uh, in the cytoplasm, but for many viruses, uh, they need to dock onto the nuclear pore and get into the nucleus, influenza virus and many DNA viruses. So let me just tell you how that happens. Here are some ways that viruses can get in the nucleus, four modes of nuclear entry. We have uh, influenza viruses are released from the endosome and their nuclear proteins are small enough to get into the nuclear pore. They can just be transported through into the nucleus. So that's one mode. Herpes virus. Remember yesterday, herpes has a portal on one of the five-fold axes of the particle. Well, when herpes is released uh, from its membrane, and we'll look at that later, uh, it docks onto the nuclear pore in such a way that the portal is, or is oriented right on top of the pore, and the DNA can come out of the portal right into the nucleus. We already saw today how adenovirus gets partially disassembled in the endosome, and then that docks on the nuclear pore, the DNA gets through. And again, in these two cases, the viruses are too big to get into the nucleus. And finally, there's some very small viruses, the parvoviruses, with single-stranded DNA genomes, 
they actually could get through the pore, but they don't. What they do is they bind to the nuclear pore, and that somehow causes the nuclear membrane to become permeable, and the viruses move through them. So the intact particle actually ends up uh, in the nucleus, and the DNA comes out there. So four ways of getting into the nucleus. Let me end up with a really interesting story just published recently that involves how differences in the receptor can determine susceptibility. So the receptor is encoded by a human gene, and you might imagine that there are differences among different humans in what the sequence is. So this is a story about rhinoviruses. There are lots of different types of rhinoviruses, which is why you get a cold every year. Uh, some of those rhinoviruses bind a receptor called ICAM-1. Some of them bind a receptor called low-density lipoprotein. I showed you a picture of that receptor binding the virus particle before. And then there's a third group of rhinoviruses, Rhino-C, that uh, bind a protein called CDHR3, and that's shown here. And CDHR3, cadherin-related family member 3, is polymorphic in the human population. What it means is some humans at this position, amino acid 529, some humans have a cysteine, and others have a tyrosine. If you have a tyrosine, you're likely to be asthmatic. A tyrosine in that position has been linked to increased uh, a risk of wheezing illnesses and hospitalization of kids for childhood asthma. It turns out that if you look at proteins with a C or a Y at this position, if you have a C, there's very little surface expression of the receptor. But having a Y makes more surface expression, and that's why you get increased wheezing because you get more virus binding and more virus yields. The, the C, the cysteine, is good. You have less surface protein, less infectivity. So that's, that's apparently been selected in human populations pretty recently. How do we know this? Well, one of the big clues is that there was recently an outbreak of HRVC in chimpanzees in Uganda. This paper was just published a few weeks ago. So about 40 or 50 chimps were infected. The idea was they, they, chimps normally don't get rhino infections unless they have contact with humans who bring it in and work with them and then it infects them. So some of these chimps died, others recovered, but they sequenced uh, their gene for cadherin-related family member three. All the chimps were homozygous for 529Y. So that means that all the chimps have a, a tyrosine, that means high surface levels, they replicate the virus really well. So chimps apparently uh, don't have the C, which means that it arose in human populations after uh, chimps. And so it's an interesting example of how pressure on a human population caused by a virus can select for receptor sequences that prevent infection. And the chimps have not had an ability to do this because they don't see rhinovirus C. Most of their evolution, chimps never saw humans. And only now that we're mingling with them, we give them this infection. And, um, they only get serious disease because they have a, a Y at that position. So it's a re really neat example of how receptor polymorphism can control susceptibility. So now we've talked about how genomes get out of the particle. You should understand all about metastability and how you trigger the release. And now in the, in the next several lectures, we're going to explore what the nucleic acids do uh, when they enter the cells. <laughs>